easier to manage in the facility. Um, and um, while they have a little bit higher risk to reoffend, um, they were amenable to treatment um, in, a, in a much um, more meaningful way a lot of times. Um, a lot of times that's just because they they have a little bit higher levels of, of brain development at 17 than, say, a 14-year-old does. And really this is about brain development. Um, the, the story here is that there's really two periods of, of life where um, brains are massively developing, right? Uh, between zero and three or four, your brain is having massive development, um, but that's mostly in the areas of learning to control your body, how to walk, talk, um, eat, all of those things. And then you kind of have this latency phase. And then again in adolescence, you have this uh, kind of building the second story in your brain of, of development and hardwiring where you learn about relationships, um, if and thinking, um, the importance of uh, uh, getting along with others, how to you know view and see yourself in society. And that development really happens between 15 and 25. Um, and so if, if those important brain functions are being taught inside of a correctional facility, um, it's important that the environment there is such that those things can be taught in a way where we don't have more antisocial teaching and learning than positive teaching and learning. And so in Oregon, we, you know, we put all these kids together and um, lots of people have questions about how do we do that? Um, first of all, there's the, the, the sight and sound rules. How do we get around sound, sight and sound? Um, you know, the, the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention um, will um, consider um, a youth, even if they're tried in adult court, a juvenile, if they committed their crime before they were 18, um, were arraigned or officially charged before they were 18, and um, were sentenced or convicted before they were 20. Um, and so we are allowed to keep those, those youth together and mix the population. And so we may have a 20-year-old and a 17-year-old have contact in a day, and, and the, the feds um, aren't concerned with that. Um, and because they're considered juveniles, um, we haven't had any issues with our PREA audits um, as well. Um, the next part is what about programming, right? Programming is very different um, for these young people. Um, and kind of along with that is safety. How do you, how do you maintain a 13-year-old and a 20-year-old in a facility, right? People think, think that and, and get really worried about it. Um, and so kind of let me kind of give an overview of how our system works really quickly. Um, I want to be mindful of time. Um, just so you can kind of get a, a picture. So we operate five um, close custody facilities around the state, um, kind of regionally, um, and four transition programs. Um, within each close custody facility, we have multiple pods or living units that contain um, or can house between 16 and 25 youth. And, and each one has kind of a distinct um, purpose and function. So we have five um, units that are certified residential level drug and alcohol substance abuse, you know, treatment centers. Four, five that are specifically um, tuned up to do sex offender treatment. Um, three that are specifically tuned up for mental health treatment. Um, uh, two that are sp specific intake and assessment centers. And that's really how this works. You come into those intake and assessment centers and we do a battery of assessments to determine risk and need. And there's, I'm sure you are aware, lots of research that says we don't risk, mix risk levels. So if you, and this is risk to reoffend, not risk to behave badly in an institution. And they're very different things. So when you mix high risk and low risk kids, you end up with all high risk. And so with, the way our state is designed, we do this, these assessments and then we assign youth to housing units around the state based on their risks, their needs, and their kind of age slash maturity level. And so you'll end up with kind of age mates all working on the same thing, all kind of at the same risk level, 
Um, the downfall of that model is that sometimes, not always, but sometimes, that means you're not going to be real close to family. And so we've implemented a lot of vid video visiting and some other things to, to accommodate for that. Um, I do want to um, look at those, those slides on the PowerPoint that I have. I just have a couple. I like pictures. Um, that on, on slide two is just our, our quick demographics of our facilities. Currently, 45% of our population in our close custody facilities are committed through the adult court. Um, and 40, 45 or 55% are from the juvenile court. Um, the length of stay on those populations vary dramatically. Um, we have paroling authority for the juvenile court kids. So as soon as we think that they can be safe, they've been rehabilitated, we have an appropriate placement for them, we can move them out. Um, the, the adult court youth have determinant sentences and, and can stay with us until their 25th birthday. Um, and then can be transferred on to the adult system or until we determine that their behavior is such that we don't, we can't manage them or they're unsafe, we can transfer them to the adult system early, um, but not before their 18th birthday. Um, our average age, there was a, a graph there, you can see, um, you know, the bulk of our, our youth are 16, 17 or 18 through 20. Um, we have some outliers on either end of that. Um, the, the next slide is about isolation incidents. And I, I was tempted to put a whole bunch of behavior slides in, um, but the rate of isolation is um, kind of a catch-all. Um, if, if it takes in our state um, a serious threat of violence or violence occurring to be placed into um, isolation, um, only, and only until you can re-regulate your behavior enough to come out or until you can be safe, to come out of that room, then isolation becomes a pretty good, you know, overall um, determination of how well youth are behaving, um, or at least being safe. And as you can see, um, our our juvenile commitment kids are the ones that are behaving violently in the facilities more often than not. Um, and um, then, you know, our our revocation kids. So. Uh, a juvenile commitment that was released and then was revoked to the facility, and then our adult commit youth. Um, so the the behaviors, and, and for those people who run institutions, um, you, you kind of know this intuitively, that 10% of your population accounts for 90% of your problems, and if you look at that 10%, it's, it's most frequently the youth that have emotion regulation problems, that come from a mental health issue or, or some sort of trauma or, or PTSD where they're just very reactive and they're reacting to their environment and, and behaving really poorly. Um, and then there's this small little slice that are using aggression and violence as a means to an end. Um, I like to say, you know, the example, I want your sandwich, I'm gonna take your sandwich and, or you're in the wrong gang, so I need to, to teach you to not be in that gang that slice of violence in our facilities is very small compared to the slice of emotional reactive youth, which surprises a lot of people. They think the adult commit kids, um, you know, kids committed with, you know, robbery with a weapon, um, you know, uh, we, we house youth that have aggravated murder in our facilities that they would be the most violent kids and, and they just aren't. Um, if you flip the page over, I have the, the last two slides are um, a study we conducted internally um, in our own research department about what happens to youth when they leave our facilities. Um, this is 36 month recidivism rates for youth that were sentenced as adults that either finish their sentence with us in an OI facility or finish their sentence in an, in an adult facility, which means they started with us and we had them transferred to the adult facility for one reason or another, or they chose to transfer, um, or they, they started in the adult facility um, because that's how we did things a, a long time ago. And so you can see the, the difference in recidivism um, overall 
right? In Oregon, we go from 22% recidivism um, with those adult commit kids to 38% recidivism. Um, but if you go to the next slide is where, where it kind of gets very staggering. Um, we, we broke this down and said, okay, well, is, is it different by risk level? So if they come in and they were already a, a moderate to low risk youth, um, and when I say risk, this does, crime severity plays into risk, but other things go into that risk factor as well, such as antisocial attitudes and beliefs, um, being a gang member, um, family history, your academic performance, age that you committed your first crime. You know, there's, there's many risk factors that go into that. Um, and so if you are a high risk youth going to the Department of, of Corrections, right, is, is on the far right of this slide, right, it, it, it's still a swing, right? It, it, we still don't get as good of outcome. But if you're not the highest of the high risk kids, and, and our cutoff line here is about 75%, so the, the top 25% of our riskiest kids, right, we have this big swing on, but our lower three quarters of our kids, we are increasing their recidivism by about 102% by transferring them to the adult system. And that goes back to that brain science, right? If, if, if it's about attaching and belonging and learning and doing, so, you know, kids learn through social learning. They see what their peers are doing and they start to emulate that thing. If that's an adult prison and they start to emulate what the adult prisoners do or what happens in adult prison, that's what they're gonna do when they get out. And so um, I'd love to answer any questions you have about how Oregon does things. And I'd love to get some advice about how to do away with our automatic waiver. Um, and uh, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll answer questions or, or turn it over to the next speaker. Before we continue, does anyone have any questions for the speaker on the phone? I do have one. Was your new system a legislative mandate or was it um, implemented by the executive branch? Um, so it, it was a legislative mandate. Um, in um, the early 90s, it, it, was a, it was kind of an interesting thing. We were part of the Department of Human Services. We were a branch of the Department of Human Services. And we operated uh, you know, several facilities around the state. Um, that were homes for boys, you know, and um, at the time, a youth in Oregon could commit a, a, a big bad crime like murder, and they would, there was no waiver process. So they would come to us, and we would hold them till their 21st birthday, and then they would be released. And that got the public really angry after a couple of really kind of high-profile juvenile murders in the state. And that's when Oregon passed um, ballot measure 11, which is our automatic waiver law. And it goes along with mandatory minimum sentencing for juveniles. And when that ballot measure passed, the legislature said, well, if we're going to have all of these kids coming in, how are we going to handle them? And create, took us out of human services, created our own agency. And in that um, bill that created us, said, this is how you're going to do it. And so since our inception, we've been doing it this way. And again, we freaked out because we thought we were gonna have these really hard kids, not realizing we had those kids before, they were just under a different jurisdiction. And it took us about six months to realize, oh, wait a second, this is the same kid we had before. They just stay longer. Um, so it was an interesting transition time for us. Madam Chair, Senator Greg Kachia. Go ahead. Yes, uh, just a question for the presenter. Uh, what kind of security do you have at these facilities? And, you know, I, uh, as I look at your uh, PowerPoint, uh, clearly you assess all the individuals coming through the system as to their uh, risk, risk factors. So, and uh, again, you have some that are high risk that are held at your OIA facilities. What kind of security do you have at these facilities? Is it... Uh, Fence security, or you know, I happen to represent uh, NYTC and CO Baston in my district, as well as a number of, of uh, 
uh, adult facilities, but you know those are pretty much uh, open campus campuses. So I was just curious, what kind of uh, security do you have? Um, that's a very good question. Uh, we have uh, a, a range of security depending on on the risk level of the youth. Um, our most secure. Um, campus is our McLaren campus um, in Woodburn, Oregon. It ha it is a fully secure campus fence. You know, it's it's got the, you know, the 20 foot curved fencing that you know no climb. You know, Sally ports um, the the whole deal. Um, and on the other end of the spectrum, we have a, a work study program, which is. Um, is unlocked um the the youth are even department of corrections kids when they they hit kind of their last six months or eight months um are allowed to to go there and um if they meet risk level clearances and those guys leave the facility in the daytime and they do work crew in the community and they they give back and um learn work skills um location opportunities and at some point even um, do unsupervised work in the community, kind of like work relief and come back at night. And so we, we kind of run the gamut, um, uh, but we, we definitely have facilities that are fully secure. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, I do have one other question. Your staffing ratio, I know it's different at the different facilities, but could you speak a little bit about your staff and ratio of staff to number of youth in the different facilities? Um, all of our facilities um, are considered youth correction facilities, and so we um, are required to meet the PREA staffing ratio, um, and I don't have that on the top of my head. Um, I believe it's, it's one to eight, um, swing shift. I know it's one to seventeen on the overnight. I can't remember what the what the day shift number is. I think it's also one to eight, but I'm not positive. Thank you. Holly Wellborn, Policy Director for ACLU of Nevada. The, the ratios, previous ratios, are one to eight during day hours and one to sixteen during sleeping hours. Thank you. That's right. It's one to seventeen. When we hit our seventeenth kid, we're we're having a problem. Thank you so much for joining us and for the the presentation. Thank you. And um, any of you are welcome to come see Oregon anytime you'd like. We may take you up on that. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Redman, and I'm a superintendent at Green Hill School, which is a roughly 180 bed juvenile facility in Washington State under the Rehabilitation Administration, Juvenile Rehabilitation, which is under the Department of Social and Health Services umbrella. For the sake of time, I'm not gonna repeat a lot of what my, my peer in Oregon said, but essentially Washington State is following the same model and a, a similar trend in how we got to the place where we're at today. Uh, in the late 90s, we had a model similar to what you all I believe have have today where our young people who had received adult sentences were in a Department of Corrections facility, a, a specific identified Department of Corrections facility, separate wing, and uh, that was for a few years. We um, unfortunately uh, received some um, threats of litigation and things of that nature associated with not being able to meet the required educational requirements for those young people at that facility as well as some of the things uh, that Holly has been speaking about. So what we ended up doing was moving to an agreement with our Department of Corrections uh, in Washington State as well as uh, some legislation to support it that would allow those young people to be housed in our juvenile facilities. Initially, it was just at Green Hill School, which is our highest security facility where I am at currently, and they would remain there for the entire duration of their um, adult commitment until they needed to transfer the Department of Corrections if their adult sentence went beyond age 21. Our jurisdiction ends at age 21 for our, our juveniles in Washington State. 
as time went on with the research around adolescent brain development and uh, really wanting to uh, just reduce any contact with the adult system uh, for any young people, uh, even those serving adult sentences, uh, we had kind of expanded that legislation to where if they, are, if they have an adult sentence that ends prior to age 21, which happens for about half of our uh, adult sentence youth, and we have approximately 64 uh, in our system today out of 500 youth in our state system in total, uh, if their sentence is to end prior to age 21, they can actually access our entire continuum of care in Washington State. So that includes starting out at my facility, Green Hill School, which is a uh, maximum medium security facility, fenced, uh, Sally Port, uh, just as um, Oregon had described. But then they have the ability to transition to uh, our youth camp, which is an 80-bed facility, not fenced, but the uh, living units are secured, it's staff secured, uh, or out to one of our eight community facilities, which are minimum security facilities where they can go to public schools or alternative schools, uh, hold jobs out in the community, uh, unsupervised, I mean, there's kind of supervision plans with their employers, uh, but they have access to the community uh, with quite regularity, and that's towards the later part of their sentence, so it helps uh, transition them back out to the community. And that service is for our juvenile uh, sentence youth as well. So full integration, uh, there's really no difference in services uh, between those in our system that are serving adult sentences and juvenile sentences, and I wouldn't even know the difference if I looked at them on my campus. The programs that we offer are dialectical behavior therapy, cultural programs. We have an on-campus high school at my facility. Uh, they go to several periods throughout the day, intermixed with juvenile sentence youth. Uh, we have a few different units on our campus to match to the specific needs of the youth, if they're um, acute mentally, mental health uh, youth or um, a more mature, um, graduated, more vocation-focused young person. We kind of try to separate them out based on uh, needs and uh, program, need, program needs as well as um, social service needs, uh, mental health or uh, substance abuse, things of that nature. We also take into account uh, maturity and age similar to what Oregon does. So in Washington State, we have three institutions, um, mine being for the 16 to 21 year old males, and we have Echo Glen Children's Center, uh, which is a smaller facility, approximately 120 beds. It doesn't have a fence, uh, but it does have uh, maximum security capability units on campus, and our female population would go there and start, female adult population would go there and start their sentence, and if their sentence ends prior to age 21, they too would be able to go out to a community facility in order for us to provide gender responsive programming for our females. Um, trying to think what else. Trying not to repeat, I think, uh, you know, in general, uh, Oregon best described uh, as far as the behaviors, uh, the behaviors are no different than the juvenile behaviors in our facility, and quite frankly, our youth serving uh, juvenile sentences are um, probably showing more behaviors, and, and I'm not sure why, I don't know if it's our adult sentence youth tend to be with us a little bit longer, and so they mature. And in a sense, we've found that they've actually stabilized uh, our, our institution a little bit. Um, our, uh, we do have an uh, agreement with the Department of Corrections, similar to Oregon, where should we find ourselves in a situation where a, um, a young person who's serving an adult sentence is uh, not on board with treatment and presenting high-risk behaviors behaviorally, you know, whether it's, you know, assaultive behavior that's beyond what we can manage and, and we try to manage it to the extent that we can. It's, it's our goal not to transfer any uh, adult uh, sentence youth to the Department of Corrections prior to age 21, but should we need to, we have that agreement with the Department of Corrections to do so after age 18. Um, I think that's about it. Yeah. Any questions for me? Madam Chair, Senator Greg Kachia. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ma'am, I just want to make sure I've got this correct. It does sound like, though, that uh, especially the 16 to 21 year old or 18 to 21 year old offenders, then when you take those in, they do go to your 
I'm going to call it a full lockdown facility until you do the assessment on them. And then it sounds like at this, I think you said 500 bed unit or uh, then, then you do an assessment and see how they're fitting in, uh, you know, and uh, what the risk is. And then, then you would in fact send them out to other facilities, uh, d depending on their risk level and, uh, you know, where you thought, and I guess what I'm looking at is uh, very similar to what I guess we have to say we do here in probably county jail, and then we look at it uh, and we think, uh, okay, this, this particular, and I'm going to call him student uh, <laughs> offender, call him what you want, but uh, would, would work at, say, CO Bastion or at NYTC. NYTC clearly is for the, uh, in Nevada is, you know, the higher risk offenders, but we would send them there or to CO Bastion, which is uh, even a co-ed facility. So, uh, again, it sounds to me like you're doing something very similar. What we're lacking is this intake facility that would uh, yeah, so provide some security and do that assessment. Yeah, so to clarify, unlike Oregon, we don't have an intake and assessment center. Uh, we only have 500 youth in our system, and that includes our youth, serve the 60, uh, roughly 60, 64 that are serving adult sentences. Uh, so so we, don't, we don't have the facility space to dedicate one facility to intake and assessment. So what ends up happening is it's youth who receive an adult sentence uh, per statute, and per our agreement with the Department of Corrections, they actually go to a Department of Corrections facility that, that does have an intake and assessment uh, facility, but they're literally there for about a day just because of the sight and sound separation issues. They go there, they receive a Department of Corrections classification because they are under an adult sentence, and the Department of Corrections is actually still responsible for the determination of their release. And we have a Department of Corrections classification counselor who also has a has a space on my campus who continues to keep tabs on those young people while they're with us um, even after they go through the intake process with the Department of Corrections. So they come to us after that one day getting classified at a Department of Corrections facility and then they go through our battery of assessment uh, screens and assessments just as our juvenile sentence youth do and uh, that, that happens just through an intake process. And that intake process is the same at every single one of our facilities because we do have youth that go straight from juvenile courts. Uh, they get their sentence and they go to one of our three main institutions. It just so happens the adults, uh, the youth serving adult sentences with the exception of the females, uh, come straight to Green Hill School from the Department of Corrections facility first because we are um, a fenced facility, a higher security level. And they're there for the early part of their, their adult sentence. The only ones that can move on beyond Green Hill School are those that have an adult release date prior to age 21. If they have an adult release date that extends beyond age 21, then we keep them the entire time. Uh, so their entire uh, sentence is uh, prior to age 21 is, is with us, and that could be anywhere from three years to four years. And so we have a we do pretty good, pretty robust programming around you know academic treatment as well as on-campus employment, vocational skills certifications, things like that, because that is a lot a long time for a young person to be at one facility, and then we transition them on to a Department of Corrections facility for the remainder of their sentence. Half of those. Um, half of the 45 that we have on our campus um, through kind of our, our risk assessment process, similar to what Oregon does, uh, can eventually, probably after they spend a year with us at Green Hill School, uh, transition to our youth camp where they're off doing um, uh, Department of Natural Resource types of activities, uh, providing fire suppression support for some of the fires that happened in Washington State, um, partnering with a Department of Corrections uh, work crew, uh, and then eventually to a community facility where they're accessing the community with regularity. I hope that answered your question. Yes, ma'am. Just to follow up, if I may, Madam Chair, but you said your facility, I believe, is, is a full lockdown facility or at least uh, completely secure. Yeah, we, it's a fence facility for 180 youth, and it's controlled ingress, egress, and uh, you know, youth are escorted across campus with staff. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a few. Um, 
the community facilities that you spoke about, the transitions, mm -hmm. could you just tell me a little bit more, how many do you have yeah. and how do you determine where they're located? And is the youth try, um, try to find a facility close to their home neighborhood? How is that decided? Yeah, so we have eight community facilities and they're across the state of Washington. Uh, we have about, I think, five on the east side and three on the west side. And they average anywhere from 12 beds to 16 beds a piece. They, uh, as far as how youth are placed there, we have a couple people who go out to all of our institutions, well, all three of our institutions, and uh, review casework meet interview the youth several times and really get to know the youth to determine what community facility best matches their treatment need and part of that decision includes does it make sense for that young person to go back near the community by which they came from or does it make sense for them not to and it it's it's unique for every youth especially our our real gang involved youth uh, there's some youth that are well well in agreement of I want to go to the east side of Washington State because my gang is over on the west side and I want to you know, be in an area that I know I'm safe, I can go to school and gain the skills, and, and we have youth that eventually end up just doing independent living on the east side in order to you know, get out of that particular lifestyle. So it's a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, yeah, so the goal is to regionalize as much as possible, especially so we can involve family with treatment, but we also do um, video conferencing, things like that, a lot of visitation. We, uh, through our community facilities, also offer uh, community involvement passes where youth can go home for a weekend with their families, you know, with, with some vetting. Uh, there's a, there's a, a, a home inspection type of situation that occurs prior to that, and it's a, it's a privilege, and so they have to earn that privilege. Uh, but we do those types of activities as well uh, for those young people in our community facilities. And just last two questions. Um, quickly, you had spoke about cultural programs. Could you tell us a little bit more about what the cultural programs are that you offer? And your female population, are you noticing a rise in your female population? And how did you handle housing that population? Yeah, so the cultural programs, and I'll speak to Green Hill School. Uh, we probably have the, the most robust cultural programs from the three institutions, and largely because we have youth that are with us longer uh, and they're older. We have uh, contracts, I have contracts with some outside providers for specific cultural groups. So an African American cultural group, Pacific Islander cultural, cultural group, Native American cultural group with a local tribal member, and um, a Latino cultural group. The groups essentially are an opportunity for youth to learn more about their cultures, their cultural identity, and where they came from. And, and it helps them learn, that, especially those that are gang involved, that there's more about me than my gang. You know, I have this other family, this is where I came from. They learn about their values within their culture, and it really helps um, kind of curb the gang behavior to an extent and, and kind of identify a different family. Uh, we have, uh, we do a powwow once a year. We have a sweat lodge on, on campus to meet the spiritual needs of our native youth. Uh, we have African American uh, cultural celebrations. A lot of different activities that we do just to um, kind of kind of meet meet the cultural needs of our youth because it's a very diverse population and we don't want to treat them as all the same. For our, did that answer your question about the cultural programs? It did. Okay. And are all the youth invited to participate so they learn more about each other's yeah, culture? They so? are. You know, I would be lying to say it tends to be just that culture, uh, but it's, it's an open invitation. And we do have some youth because maybe they don't look like those youth. They may have grown up in a culture that does look like th th those youth. So we, we do open invitation. Uh, for our female population, I'm trying to remember your question, uh, they all go to Echo Glen Children's Center, uh, and we have a uh, unit that is specific for um, all females, so we can make sure that we're providing them gender responsive uh, treatment within that unit. But they, they integrate with um, our, our male population at school, 
and um, other kind of campus activities. Uh, the difference is typically our female population, by the time they come to our system, uh, because they haven't been able to um, be kept locally successfully, they've probably kind of been through a lot of local sanctions and diversion opportunities and things like that. By the time we get them, they're about age 16 or older. Uh, so they are housed with our younger male population, so 12 to 15 year old at Echo Glen. So we don't have, you know, same age uh, boys and girls typically at one institution because they are young people and they find things to do. So it does help us manage that pretty well. And, and the girls, since they're there until age 21, they do provide a sense of stability for our younger males who are often more immature and, and, and things like that. They take more of a leadership role. Um, as far as a rise, we have about uh, 30 uh, females in our system right now, and that's not high. We've had more than that. Uh, we, we've had a little bit of an uptick over the past few months. Uh, we were down closer to about 25, 24. Uh, but in general, we're, we're fairly low. Uh, we have a community facility for girls that I believe is funded for 12 beds, and it's always operated under capacity at about 9 or 10. Uh, and then we have our living unit on campus at Echo Glen Children's Center. Unfortunately, with our uh, female population, you know, typically when we receive them from county programs, they're ac acute mentally ill, you know, a lot of self-harm behavior, a lot of exposure to trauma, and so uh, Echo Glen Children's Center, it's got pretty robust, you know, psychological services, medical services, things like that, uh, in order to, to help get them healthy so that then they can transition out to the community facility, which is our ultimate goal. We do have, uh, I believe as of today, one or two females that are serving adult sentences uh, in our system, and they are currently at Echo Glen Children's Center. And the same rules apply, just as our males, if their release date is prior to age 21, then they can serve the, the later part of their sentence at the community facility for females. Otherwise, uh, they would transition to a female um, Department of Corrections institution at age 21. Thank you. See no other questions? Just one, Madam Chair, Senator Goikichia. Uh, I was just curious with that last statement she made. I, I would think it would probably be problematic if you had a, a f male or female, but if they realized at age 21 they were just going to go to a, an adult facility and there was no way to, you know, gain any ground, whether they be at your facility or a community-based facility, it looks like they'd be a lot harder to deal with. Do you find that? Uh, not so much. A lot of times the young people kind of see it as a gift. They see it as a gift that they've been able to spend as much time possible in a juvenile facility and participate in age-appropriate programs and kind of benefit from that because they do acknowledge and realize early on that they're not going to get that in an adult facility. So they really maximize getting vocational certifications, their high school diploma, um, age-appropriate treatment, things like that. Uh, you know, do they get short timers or the fatalistic attitude because they know they're going to eventually transition? I mean, we work with them on that with our treatment model, uh, but but ultimately they try to maximize their time with us as long as possible, and they they see it as as a gift. Not all of them, you know, but most of them, most of them really do. And fortunately, with the, our our partnership with the Department of Corrections and good relationship, we have that one classification case manager person who serves at all the institutions, but they're pr predominantly stationed at mine. Um, some of the conversations that that person has with these young people is your behavior here in the juvenile department um, can dictate your placement in the Department of Corrections. So they take into account good behavior in and, and treatment, you know, involvement and things like that. That's all credited towards their stay at a Department of Corrections facility so that it, it can impact their ultimate classification as to where they go because uh, there's different levels of security in, the, in our Department of Corrections facilities. They can be more likely to go to a work camp of some sort um, after they finish with us as opposed to a um, higher secure facility uh, where they would have less opportunities for those things. Uh, also, it, since Department of Corrections is in charge of their release date, their behavior with us impacts their, their good time. So, and the, and the youth know that. 
Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you, ma'am. Got it. Thank you, Assemblywoman. I hope that those presentations were enlightening. I think, you know, again, this is the beginning of a conversation. I want to quickly summarize some of the um, conclusions and findings from our facilities tours, and I want to publicly thank the administrators from, you know, Warden Baker at Lovelock Correctional Center, Jack Martin, Frank Cervantes, Ms. Duffy, um, I'm forgetting a lot of people, uh, that were very transparent throughout this process, that, you know, welcomed us, let us, um, in some instances, speak to some of the juveniles that are living in those facilities. It really um, helped to en enhance our understanding so we can move forward with solutions uh, and models that look like the models that we heard about today. Um, I think I spent, a, you know, enough time on Lovelock Correctional Center, plus you're having a presentation from them today, but I do want to um, state, you know, our conclusions. We did not tour Florence McClure uh, facility because it's the only female uh, facility in the Nevada Department of Corrections, but we did not tour that facility for a simple reason. They simply do not have any accommodations for female young female inmates at this time. I think that's really our most pressing problem that needs to be addressed pretty immediately, whether that's through uh, regulation, through contract. Uh, there's nowhere to house young women that are tried as adults. With, we know of two young women, um, potentially three, potentially four, uh, but one was transferred out of state Another juvenile, I don't believe she's been sentenced yet, but um, I believe that, that there's been an agreement for that individual to stay in either a local or state facility. But um, really the default policy for young women is placing them in segregation or sending them out of state. And there have been uh, cases filed, sex discrimination lawsuits filed in the state of Wyoming and in Tennessee. Uh, claiming that because there are no options available to those young women, that um, that it's a violation of their rights. So I think that is a, a pressing concern that the, the state and our, our administrators and the DOC really, um, and the, the, the DOC is aware of that. They reject um, segregation as an option. There were some, some um, conversations about putting a portable unit on the campus of Florence McClure to house the young women, and they'd essentially live in isolation for, for the duration of their time, which could be as long as three years, and um, it's just simply unacceptable. As far as um, local adult facilities, are, are, I, I think we need to put CCDC in a different category. Um, first, Parr Boulevard and Elko jails, they're simply just not equipped. They do not have enough interaction with young people. Uh, which, you know, is, is a good thing that we're not sending a lot of people to those facilities. Be, um, the, you know, they're either staying in the local juvenile facilities or just the certification process or direct file process. They're just not doing it as often because their population is so small. But when we talked to PAR, it seemed like PAR Boulevard understood the policies and procedures in PREA and what was required of them. ELCO seemed to have a misunderstanding of PREA and the, a misunderstanding of what... Um, of, of um, what it actually means when a child is adjudicated as an adult because they haven't had a kid in their um, facility since 2012 when um, sight and sound separation was enhanced. So they, uh, their understanding was that once they are you know, certified as an adult, they are an adult for under the law. So we had, you know, long conversations with them about that and some, some clarification. I spoke to the sheriff and he was, uh, um, he seemed to understand that was very, you know, open and receptive. We'll continue to work on those policies with them. But those, if a child does come into those facilities, they are placed in segregation. And, you know, we ha have no idea how long they will be in segregation. They're placed in the infirmary. They don't really have any programming. The yards are insufficient. They're just simply not an appropriate place for a child. CCDC. We were really impressed with the educational programming and other programming at the Clark County Detention Center. And we say that as the ACLU, we don't always give a lot of compliments to CCDC. But um, we, we were very um, impressed with the principal, not just as an educator, but he seemed to have a genuine interest in the kids that he was working with. He also had a lot of questions about, you know, um, the boys in Lovelock and wondering if any of, you know, his former students, how they were doing and um, wanted to know, you know, how they were being housed. They're programmed the entire day. They have access to a teacher the entire day. So um, 
we're, we're pleased with that programming. And really our only, our, our, I mean, our criticisms of CCDC is the facility as a whole, the yards are, you know, that concrete chain link fence ceiling um, design. They've had issues with their private contractors for food uh, um, and medical care. Um, so, and of course, if it's not suitable for an adult, it's not suitable for a child. Juvenile facilities, we'll, we'll lump them. We, we went to Jan Evans, we went to um, DJJS, the Pecos Boulevard facility, and um, we, I also went out to Elko, went to their juvenile facility. They operate very much the same. Um, I think um, Mr. Martin's facility, the county should should um, give him an appropriation to get some construction, uh, fix, you know, floors and fixtures and things like that, but if there aren't any dangerous conditions. The culture and of, um, you know, the mindset of, of our juvenile administrators is, is appropriate, evidence-based. Kids get programming all day, and of course, because they're juvenile facilities, they're, they're meeting those minimum standards, and in a lot of ways, exceeding those standards. So we do, our conclusion is, those facilities would be more appropriate for juveniles across the board. Um, we also toured Summit View. Uh, Summit View, no, no state juvenile facilities actually house certified youth, youth tried as adults. But we toured Summit View because it had been proposed as a potential alternative location in the past. So we, we did an assessment. Summit View, we, we're not, we don't like that punitive design with the fencing, and, um, but you know, that's a philosophical argument that we can continue having and more of a best practices inquiry than what we were looking for, but um, as a whole, the facility does meet the needs of kids. We wish that they had more family interaction, um, uh, but they do provide you know, some family interaction, picnics and uh, visitation in, in certain circumstances. So with that, you know, those major conclusions are, we really need to look at where we're placing our youth. We really need to look at how other states are applying this. And our recommendation, primary recommendation, is to adopt a program, a model similar to what Washington State and Oregon have that's a contract with the Nevada Department of Corrections where they're paying to house some youth in these different facilities. We completely recognize that this is going to be a dramatic shift and it will probably take a very long time to um, actually develop this programming, but it is our goal to start this conversation now and to see where, where it will lead us and to see what, what opportunities we have in the future. So um, another proposal, you know, leading up to that would be if we can could have a study, some sort of, you know, needs assessment study, looking at the amount of bed space in facilities, looking at what it would actually cost our local and state facilities to take on a project like this and overhaul their programming, so that way we're we're taking um, every um, every stakeholder's um, thoughts into account, but. We appreciate you for having us here today, and if you don't have any questions for me, that will conclude our conversation. Um, I, and actually, I will say we did, um, our, we have the PowerPoint, which is quite detailed, but we published our report on our findings, Youth in Confinement. It was published on our website. I brought, there's copies available to the public. I brought copies for the committee. It's very detailed um, and provides more insight on our findings and uh, recommendations, and as, as well as the history of this issue.